I'm um, here with Abe uh, Edelbaum, and he's uh, with the uh, the management of the Krugerdorf uh, Cemetery in uh, just south of uh, Kirkland Lake and uh, north of Englehart, Ontario. And uh, we're going to talk a bit a bit about the significance of the the cemetery and plans for its future. So, um, Abe, did you just want to give us a little a brief uh, introduction of of yourself and uh, your um, history here in the uh, Northern Ontario, the Northeastern Ontario. I'm a long-term resident of Kirkland Lake. Uh, my parents came here in the 1930s uh, during the Depression years and the North was booming with the gold mines and uh, and copper mines. Uh, as a long-time resident, I eventually ended up inheriting the uh, chore of uh, or responsibility of continuing the operation of the Krugadar Cemetery. Is there supposed to be a red light on there? I don't see it. It should be on. Hold on a second. Something might be missing there. Uh, I don't think you're operating. Oh, it's rolling. Yep. It is. Okay. There you go. Yeah. I, oh, I'll edit that out. Okay. There's, there's no I guess red. there's a green light. There. Well, the red light's on this side there. Right okay. there. <laughs> I can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> So anyhow, the yeah. current situation is is that the Krugerdorf serves the communities uh, from Inglehart, Kirkland Lake North mm. to Timmins, and at one time went over to the Rouen area okay. in, in Quebec. Uh, as the uh, Jewish population in northern Ontario has declined over the years, uh, the Krugerdorf management and internments have dropped accordingly. The long-term prospects of the continuation uh, are going to be eventual uh, financial strain to keep the property managed and uh, and active. Okay. Um, how, how did uh, Krugerdorf get started? The first internment in Krugerdorf was in 1905. At that time, the railroad was pushing its way north, and the story is that some workers were coming home on the river in a canoe uh, after working on the railroad. Canoe capsized and one in individual drowned. Jewish background, and consequently, somebody by the name of Hembruff, uh, what was the last name? Henerovsky, pardon mm -hmm. me. Henerovsky was the name donated this piece of land for the first internment. And through the years, uh, the uh, land was formally transferred to the Krugerdorf group, and uh, we're in our 112th year now. Wow, 112 years. That's, uh, that's amazing. It's almost... <laughs> it's a page of history. It's, it's, a, it's incredible. Now, the, uh, the Edelbaum family, um, tell me a little bit about how they settled in this area. Uh, you mentioned that they came in the, during the Depression. They came during the Depression years, 1932, I believe, in that 32, 33 uh, time there. Uh, my father worked as a salesman in a furniture store yeah. and then eventually uh, uh, started uh, canvassing dry goods and then opened a retail store and uh, continued on uh, the store actually was run by my late wife mm -hmm. and it closed in 1987 so we certainly had over 50 years of retailing right. in in the Kirkland Lake area. I branched off into real, <coughs> real estate and uh, uh, containerized tree growing, mm -hmm. greenhouses, uh, tree seedlings, uh, so we were pretty diversified. Right. Now, is, is, are your family members buried in, um, in Krugerdorf? My mother, yeah. my father, and my wife right. are in Krugerdorf. Okay. And is that is that uh, one of the reasons why you became involved with the management, or is there... Well, actually, uh, my father-in-law uh, was quite active mm. in uh, upgrading the property site, and he managed Krugerdorf for a number of years. Mm. When he passed away, my wife took over, and yeah. she ran it. For quite a few years, and then, in um, after her her death, uh, I was sort of the last in line, and mm -hmm. I ended up running it 
um, for the past, um, I guess, 20 years. 20 years, eh? Um, what's, uh, so, what's involved in running it from, uh, from your perspective? I mean, it's, it's, it's not a historic cemetery by any means. It's, it's still an active cemetery. It's still active, active cemetery. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what's uh, in your day to day uh, well, the, role? Well, the, uh, the the maintenance is obviously during the summertime, right. where the uh, gra grounds, the grass has to be cut, and right. the uh, trimming around the headstones, uh, minor maintenance work. Yep. We have a chapel there that usually has required uh, maintenance uh, through the years. We've replaced the siding, uh, put in vinyl windows, uh, better doors. Uh, so there's uh, yeah. general housekeeping between building and uh, property. Right. And, and then uh, do, you, do you hire uh, contractors to yeah. do yes. the maintenance? You don't we, do it we yourself. Hire, we hire contractors <laughs> to, 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 to do the grass right. or the brush maintenance. Yeah. And uh, if there's any tree cutting, we yeah. hire people to do that. Now, if there's an excavation for yeah. an internment, yeah. uh, we've... Uh, been able to hire a local contractor with okay. uh, excavation equipment to look after that. And then heads, bases are poured, headstone uh, right. is uh, put into place. Now in this um, uh, TVO video uh, that mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, I guess it was made as part, it, well, it, it's uh, derived from uh, Steve Pakin's uh, program, The Agenda. There was talk about how difficult it is to have internments in the winter time, and one of the people interviewed in the video said that they had to walk through four or five feet of snow. Is that still a problem, or, or do you actually are you the able to rent? The, the last winter internment yeah. we had uh, was Eddie Dukes, and yeah. that's uh, the interview. That's in, the fellow who said yes. And uh, we don't have four or five feet of snow yeah. here, but we, <laughs> we we do have snow drifts, so that yeah. has to be plowed. Yeah, and uh, the. Uh, the site excavation, usually the ground uh, is reasonable to work with underneath the snow. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, uh, what you say, freeze hard. Right. Uh, the building has electric heating in it, so we're able to have some sort of shelter uh, for the uh, funeral ceremony and internment rites that take place. Uh, interesting thing has happened is that mm -hmm. uh, with some of these winter uh, deaths, uh, some families have uh, allowed cremation, mm. and uh, while it is not orthodox to have the Jewish bodies cremated, right. uh, we've actually had to move with the time and location, mm. and we've changed our bylaws that we do allow okay. cremation and internments. So we have had cases of winter deaths mm -hmm. which have been interned yeah. in the spring. In the springtime, right. So, uh, what are what are some of the challenges you're facing? Uh, we talked briefly about the uh, um, the Jewish population and uh, uh, how, like uh, as, as other populations in the north, uh, is 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 um, uh, being reduced as people move out. So, what are some of the challenges you're facing uh, with administrating uh, Krugerdorf? The biggest uh, challenge is trying to put into some system or fundraising in place yeah. that will uh, replace the limited diminishing funds that we have now. Mm. Okay. And any, um, have you developed any plans or are you still looking into uh, how this is going to be done? Well, if there would be a way that we could turn the yeah. uh, cemetery into a charitable organization, yeah. yes that Revenue Canada would allow us to give charity receipts, right. it would be easier for us to get funds. Right. And that is done. I mean, I know in Toronto, some of the cemeteries that some of my um, family are buried in, are tr they're called trusts. Yes. So, and yeah. they're, they're very much uh, Yeah, well, sometimes it's a synagogue or it can be a yeah. church. Yeah. And uh, you can have some arrangement that allows you to issue a receipt and yeah. then transfer the funds over it to that, but the rules of exist now. Yeah. Uh, we cannot issue a tax deductible receipt. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, the Jewish uh, population in northeastern Ontario, we talked briefly about this, and uh, you made some references to the census uh, figures. Um, 
How many people in the, the Northeast today uh, identify themselves as being Jewish? I really have no idea. Okay. Uh, we have uh, uh, a question in Kirk Link here, having a hundred families <coughs> at one time. Right. We're down now to about uh, uh, two ladies, two uh, widows, yeah. uh, myself a widower, yeah. and uh, there's a young gentleman here uh, yeah. that uh, is here, so we're 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 about one, two, th about four households here. Four households. Four right. households. Right. I believe the Timmins area has somewhere between ten and fifteen 10 families. And 15, right, right. And the uh, the synagogue that uh, was quite active in the Kirkland Lake area that's been closed for ten, fifteen years, or a lot long, longer, longer than, longer than longer, that. Longer, Seventies, I would imagine. Uh, in, in, yeah, it could could very well area. could very yeah. well be. Uh, Timmins had its own uh, synagogue so, until as, yeah. that time as well. I understand yeah, in that yeah. the same type of area. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess also Iroquois Falls. Uh, Iroquois Falls still has a synagogue avenue. Synagogue avenue, synagogue street. street. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't believe there's anybody Jewish out there, there anymore. I think there's, there, what I read a couple of years ago yeah. was that there was an uh, elderly woman who belonged to the Abram, Abramson. Yes, could, I think that was in the Abramson Falls. family. Yeah. yeah. But the Nossoff Nos family was very active in the yeah. um, Erico Falls, Ansonville area. Right. And they moved away years ago. How does the, um, and I know this is, we're moving a little bit away from uh, Krugerdorf, but I still think it's, it's, it's somewhat related. Uh, in terms of services, do you have like a visiting rabbi that comes in every now and then, or? No, no. no. Uh, Timmins on a few occasions uh, had uh, a rabbi come in for the high holidays, right. but uh, I don't recall that okay. taking place in the past 10 years. Okay. Um, can you tell me just a little bit about some of the uh, the people in, in Northeast Ontario who, who were Jewish, who contributed to the development of this area? I mean, we talked a little bit about um, um, Eddie Duke and um, and a few other people from the Kirkland Lake area. Um, did you, like the Bokovetskis, for example, in, in, in Timmins, did they have a store in Crickland Lake as well? Or? No, no. Oh. There's a, yeah. Uh, I think you've got to yeah. just turn your pages back a okay. bit here. All right. Uh, let's go back to about uh, the early 1900s. Okay. 1901 in that area there. <coughs> uh, Baron de Hirsch, a yeah. German industrialist and philanthropist, oh, okay. had this feeling that he wanted to move Jewish families out of the urban areas into the more of the rural life that could take place. Mm -hmm. He sponsored family development groups in a number of places around the world, including uh, the mid-Canada uh, in the prairies. At that time, he had a Jewish group of 50 families that he sponsored that set up in a place called Krugedorf mm -hmm. as farmers. They were not experienced. Uh, farming is not as advanced as it is today. They struggled and re really had a hard time existing. At about 1905, 1906, this was the start of the gold mine discoveries and the cobalt mine discoveries. And these Jewish families realized that there was greater potential in these areas uh, entering either as merchants or other services. And consequently, they abandoned the uh, Krugerdorf uh, establishment completely. And this is where the first internment uh, that came through the railway. So there's a price of change. So uh, the Jewish population ended up in professions, in teaching, in medicine, in law, in mm -hmm. dentistry, mm -hmm. and uh, in other uh, services. Right. But there was one individual, Paul Penna, who founded Agnigo Eagle in Cobalt, who was uh, a very devout uh, Jewish uh, uh, believer. Uh, and he actually made quite a, a living as, as a miner. 
Yeah, this Paul I did. This, Paul I, this I don't. This yeah. I don't know. In, in coal, if you go to cobalt, there's yeah, the Paul I, Penna I knew there were some people in, in mining equipment <laughs> there and yeah. the background there. Yeah. But uh, so. when my father-in-law emigrated from Russia, right. uh, he was sponsored by a relative, mm. and one of his first jobs that he had was working in the silver mine in cobalt. Really, as a a, a miner. As a miner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's quite something. It, yeah. Um, how how big is the Krugerdorf Cemetery? I mean, how many people? Uh, uh, I think are, are we have here? about a hundred and ten or a hundred and fifteen right. interments okay. there. Yeah, that's nice. That's a uh, um, and and it, it's it's spanned over the last hundred. Uh, it's been in existence for one hundred twelve years. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. What um um what sort of what do you see as the legacy of the, the Jewish community in this area? Have you had a chance to, to think about that in terms of you know sort of providing the service of the cemetery for this area and um, you know knowing people from the area uh, is, what, what is, is there a legacy that you see um, that the, the Jewish people have, have contributed to the development of this area? I think they've been very